The rows between Griffith and Barton, Duffy and Childers had caused huge division in the Irish delegation. Collins had tried to remain aloof, but due to his attendance at private meetings with Griffith, he was seen as a Griffith ally. Childers, for example, considered that both Griffith and Collins had yielded too much on military defence. The Irish delegation essentially operated as two camps. Griffith and Collins did much of the negotiation, while the others felt increasingly sidelined. Duffy returned to Dublin on November 4th. He sought to personally persuade the Cabinet that Griffith and Collins were conceding too much and that they needed to be reined in. He was informed that the Cabinet were happy with how things were proceeding in London. De Valera and Griffith had agreed a joint strategy. They had given non-specific assurances on association with Commonwealth and Crown in return for Irish unity. They could then, in a sense, stand aside and put the pressure on the British government to deliver that unity. But James Craig was about to throw a spanner in the works. Craig seems to have been initially receptive to an exploration of how an all-island solution might work. But by the afternoon of Monday, November 7th, having met with the Conservative Unionists Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson and Laming Worthington Evans, he had changed his mind. He would not now contemplate any form of an all-island solution. This left Lloyd George unable to deliver on his part of the understanding he had brokered with Griffith and Collins. Collins returned to London on the morning of Tuesday, November 8th. He wrote to Kiernan early that morning. His letter is somewhat introspective and hints at a disagreement that the couple may have had before he left Ireland. Dearest Kit, I've got here safely. Arrived number 15 a few minutes after 5.30. Crossing extremely rough, but we did not feel it. Actually, I had a large dinner on the boat. Slept practically the whole way on the train, turned in for about two hours here, up at 7.30. Mass at 8, and now I'm writing this before breakfast. You'll be glad to know that I'm feeling tip-top, but I am lonely, and very, very discontented. You needn't ask if I thought of you at Mass and a candle. Yes, indeed, and I'm thinking so very much of you now. The weekend, notwithstanding my own unpleasantness, did me a great deal of good. The constant and changing fresh air was a great tonic. Yesterday morning's journey back was lovely. Very cold, but I didn't really feel that. Practically the whole way I was lost in admiration of the view. The various colourings of the leaves were beautiful in the extreme, and as we came in view of Loch Owl, the sun, which seemed to have caught all the waters as if in a saucer, shone brilliantly on the lake and transformed it into a glimmering silver. Really, I never thought things looked so lovely. I wonder why. Perhaps it was that I was happy, and yet I kept thinking of that parting message of yours about the pity. You do misjudge me there. I could not have expressed myself properly, I'm afraid. It is only that I do understand some of those inevitable things, and I do hope I didn't seem unkind. How did you get on yesterday? Granard Market is held on an ill-chosen date. Monday. How could anyone be in proper mood or manner for buying and selling on a Monday morning? Of course, this is the real explanation of the late hour of starting, isn't it? Anyway, I hope the day was not very strenuous for you, and that you got through all right. Let me know, please. As usual, when I got back to town, there were several people looking for me in a meeting. Then, of course, I became remorseful and blamed myself for not having started in proper time, but that had to be got over also. Are you thinking of me now? And how are you feeling about it all? When do you come to town again? That's important. Do you understand? I must go to breakfast. Goodbye for today. Michal. That day... Collins went to the Grosvenor Hotel near London's Victoria Station, where he and Griffith met with Lloyd George's Cabinet Secretary, Tom Jones. Jones had been dispatched to sound them out on the Prime Minister's latest plan. He told them that Craig would not budge and recorded that Collins was visibly upset. Griffith, however, kept his thoughts to himself. Jones then asked whether they would be willing to accept a Southern Parliament and a subsequent Boundary Commission. This was not the unity that they had desired, but the alternative would be the collapse of Lloyd George's coalition and the probable ascension to power of the Conservative Unionist Andrew Boner Law. 
Lloyd George's argument, as advanced by Jones, who pretended it was his own, was that Griffith and Collins might do better to trust the devil they knew. Collins immediately voiced his disapproval of a boundary commission. It sacrificed the essential unity of the country. Jones agreed, but asked what was the alternative. Chaos? Crown, colony, government and civil war? Having thrown the kite, he undertook to sound Lloyd George out on what he had sold Griffith and Collins as his own proposal. The next day, Griffith assured Jones that Sinn Féin would not oppose a boundary commission if the PM suggested it, saying, If the PM cares to make it, we would not make his position impossible. We cannot give him a pledge, but we will not turn him down on it. We are not going to queer his pitch. Collins was not at that informal meeting. The next day he wrote to Kiernan. If he was aware, as we retrospectively are, of the momentousness of the British machinations unveiled by Jones at the Grosvenor Hotel, he did not even hint at such things. Instead, he chastised her for her lack of correspondence. Kitty dearest, this is the third letter I have written without a word from you. It's early yet, of course, but I have to be at a conference at 10.30 and there's much to be done before we leave. You did not write on Monday, did you? Of course I know how busy you were. That is, if you got up at all, which I'm rather inclined to think was what actually happened. I wonder. No excitement of any kind yesterday. Just one meeting. With several interviews and I was late enough going to bed, I regret to say. However, so long as one sticks to early rising, one can't go very far wrong. Very unpleasant days these are. Fog gradually develops during the day. The mornings are clear enough, but the clearness quickly departs. It's doing it now and I shall want the electric light in a few minutes. Now I must go to breakfast. And if I don't write anything more today, you'll understand that it's because circumstances will be against me. I'm just able to finish it. That's all. Fondest love, Michal. Collins returned to Dublin that Friday and hoped that Kiernan would meet him there.